So we're here in Glendale, and it's Sox Degrees, and Paul Canerco is here. And my first question to Paul Canerco is, what's the average day for Paul Canerco currently, right now? Uh, as far as my routine, my itinerary like, on the day? what do you do? What are you doing? Well, in short, whatever my wife tells me, that's number one. But uh, get up, uh, I got three kids that need to get, right now I have three kids that go to three different schools, uh, three different start times, three different finish times. So... Uh, I'm getting usually two of them together uh, to go to school together, uh, you know, in, in the car uh, or the other one. So getting kids to school is a big thing. Um, after that, usually try to get a workout in, um, if you can't tell. And uh, okay. <laughs> no, I feel terrible. I need to get back on track. Uh, this whole COVID thing, I've been kind of in a, a spiral since the beginning of that. Like I think a lot of people can relate, but I need to, I need to get it back. But a little workout maybe, a little golf. Um, if I can fit it in, maybe a little practice session or something along those lines. And then by that time that's all over, kids need to be picked up, dinners need to be made, maybe practices uh, they need to be brought to, and then uh, do it all again the next day. I got two things on that. One, do you know what other people look like in a spiral? <laughs> <laughs> Depends. There's a few, yeah. Because if I, this is the spiral? Well, you know, it's all, it's all relative to who you are, but I've... Uh, I definitely, uh, I retired when I was 38 and I had my 46th birthday a few weeks ago. And in the last year is like the first time I felt really different than even when I was playing or retired. Yeah. Right, like where it's like, okay, I'm old, older. Like I'm, I feel like this is what everybody's been talking about kind of thing where less motivation to want to get in there, um, work out, less terrible diet. You know, my, diet, my you. diet's never been great, but I've always been able to like, trumpet with the work outs you know or work but right now i feel like i'm i'm underwater there you know what i mean like my diet's bad and i can't catch up and then you start having like the body things right like you can't go as hard as you used to and you you have like one workout that's kind of like oh, that was a great workout the next day you wake up and you can't get out of bed you know it's like th that stuff is kind of like this is the first year year and a half where that stuff has kind of started to happen i'm like oh, all right this is what they've been talking about you know so things have changed so much since you retired it, it they, they always say things change, but I feel like the last five, six, seven years. So you walk in here and we talk about nutrition. Um, you know, you wear a wristband and you're going to find out if you're light on this and a little too heavy on that. <laughs> How would you have adapted to that? I mean, you probably just would have because you were active, but would that have been hard for you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's like you say, things change. Um, and, and there's no doubt, I think in the last whether it's technology or whatever that's involved with it, it's been really ramped up over the last five or six years, even compared to, comparable to any other span. Um, as a player, when you're doing it, I think that um, it's, it's a little bit more gradual, you know, because you're involved in it. But yeah, if I would have been out of the game and then came back in and see what's going on now, I mean, I've already seen things since I've been here today. We were just talking with um, Brian Johnson in the video room about what goes on in there. And that's crazy some of the stuff in terms of like what's expected now or what's the norm um but By i think way, is bj it, paying you to, to make sure that you mentioned his name clearly okay. clearly i have uh so that, that, that's his vibe yeah right? no no doubt um <laughs> <laughs> definitely give him a little plug in there yeah. he's in he's in the hole in there all the time yes. and uh that's he does a great job comes from. yeah he's in the hole <laughs> he <laughs> looks like he has he that is probably the one constant i don't think he's shaved since <laughs> since i retired um but, you know, I mean, I just think it's, it's, a, it's a gradual thing. I'm sure there was things in the middle of my career I was doing that if some guy walked back in that had been out of the game for five or ten years, he'd walk back and be like, what's this? This is like crazy. I, we never did this when I played, you know. Um, so th there's always that constant evolution of the player of the game. And um, as an ex-player, it, it is very, uh, whether it's like the unwritten rule stuff or the stuff we're talking about, it's very easy to get like, well, this isn't as good as when I played. Like, this should be, this is bad. You know, this is, that's your knee-jerk reaction always is like, if it's different, it's not as good as when I, you know. And it's, so I, I get that, and you definitely have those urges. But the reality is, and I've always kind of related it to, like, music. The, the music that's great is usually deemed by, like, the young people, right? Like, high school, college, that's what's popular, that's what's great. And you're not going to tell them about, like, the music that you liked. And... You just have to, as you get older, you have to punt on that and just be like, you know what, like my time is kind of coming and gone. This is what's great and this is what's good and this is what the norm is and this is like kind of what's right at the moment. And 
um, it's their time. And so I don't, I don't get too caught up in that kind of stuff. You know, I kind of, I try to learn about it. I try to see what, and some of it is like, this is bad. This is a bad idea. Like this, this should go away. This was better when I played, but most of it, you try to say that kind of stuff. It never comes off. Well, the bad, the old guy always comes off looking worse. Right. Right. You just, you will always come off looking worse. If you try to tell why it was better when you played, you know, that's a great segue. You, remind me of one of your contemporaries and a guy you've played against a lot, Derek Lee. And the thing I always loved about Derek and his managers loved is put him in the lineup every day. Don't have, doesn't have to come to the office until we tell him he made the all-star team. And you were that kind of player for the White Sox for a long time. But I remember seeing Derek in an off season about five years ago, and I think he retired in 2010, 2011. So a little before you did. And Derek was very honest about what he was good at and what his maybe his weaknesses were and he just looked at me and said i can't believe how good the players are now mm. like he was blown away and derek lee as you know was a great player but even he was like this is different do you ever have those moments where you're watching a game no. and you're like wait a yeah. minute he just hit a home run on a 101 mile an hour fastball up at the chin are you kidding me no doubt i mean even just the type of player i was like you can't just be a first baseman now that you know, is just maybe at best adequate for, I mean, like just the style, almost everything going on, everything is so heightened, the athleticism out there. Um, I, I watch guys, I was at um, Grand Canyon University a few weeks ago. Uh, there's a, a hitting, hitting guy that had some pros out there, major league guys, minor league guys. And I'm still, this is probably the first time I've been up close to the cage in a while, years. And it was frightening to see how hard these guys were hitting balls and how far they were hitting balls and i'm sitting here going like i've had a better career than him 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 statistically and i'm looking at these guys going there's no way i could have in my best days done what this guy is doing right now in this batting cage onto this field like so there is definitely like everything and, and i feel like you know anybody who would have came back again that played in the 60s or 70s and watched but again i just think that there's been a jump because I think players take care of themselves a lot better. I think they're much um, mentally, they're doing more things to get better and figure out ways to get better because probably a lot of technology exists, they can do that. And so you're just seeing a breed of player um, that is just, you know, maybe there's been a, a break in the, you know, especially with the pitching, we know how hard guys throw and all that. There's just something that's different that wasn't on the natural progression that used to be from 60s to 70s to 80s. There just seems to be a spike of, uh, some crazy talent um, and, and being able to pull it off out there. I just wonder what you would have been like now though, and obviously it's not possible, but talking to you about hitting, when we had you in the booth a couple, a couple years ago, your analytical mind for hitting, we could do an entire podcast of have a monitor, show PK swings, and you'd be like this, 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 this. <laughs> What do you think you would have been like with all the video and everything available now? Um, well, it could be, I would say two things. Um, a lot better as a player, or I'd be sitting here in a straight jacket. One or the other, because there's a lot of rabbit holes you can go down. And I definitely have the mind that um, was hungry for that stuff. And I don't shy away from it. And I don't... Uh, so it, it's something you have to monitor. Um, and, and I think maybe that might've been the only thing, um, I hate to even use these words, but I might've been ahead on or ahead of my time in terms of like wanting to care about all of the, all of that stuff. There were other guys too, but I'm saying like, I was maybe, um, there's guys now caring about that stuff for sure that are looking at, you know, 3D imaging of where their body is in space and all that. And um, I was always into that back then and wanted to know answers for things. So, um, but you know, it is at the end of the day, the great thing about like say hitting, for example, is um, my beliefs on what makes a good swing and where you need to be and the things that need to kind of transpire in a swing. Um, I don't think all the stuff that's going, you're still gonna arrive at the, at the same answer today as you were 10 years ago as you were 20 years ago it changes a little bit over time because why the pitching changes right like how guys pitch if you go back and watch swings from like the 60s and 70s you see different characteristics because guys were throwing different different then and so swings kind of morph towards that and then you see guys maybe through the 90s throwing sinkers and sliders and everything down and then you started to see swings kind of morph to that 
And now, right now, it appears over the last couple of years, you see the pitchers maybe having the upper hand. And so now it's kind of fun to see how are guys fighting to, to kind of like get back and adjust as a league to that. You know, I, I think about those things. I watch those things and I used to have great talks with Mike Gellinger about that kind of stuff. And it's all true and real, but only the guys who have kind of been like in there and kind of see it can kind of understand um, understand it um, in a way that's, you know, at that at those levels. And I, I enjoy it. That's, it's the only thing I really feel like I know. <laughs> I mean, whether it be in baseball, the rest of baseball or in life, like the only thing I feel like I really have a handle on is the hitting stuff. If I were to ask one of your players that you coach for their impersonation of Coach Paul Canerica, what would the hallmarks of that impersonation be? Where would they go? Oh my God, these kids are right now, the, I'm coaching a 13U team and they're at that age where, you know, they're starting to like think they're really cool. And uh, the, the, even they, they mock me to my face sometimes. Um, <laughs> what they, they don't know around the corner though, I'm gonna start running them because they're getting old <laughs> enough where you can run them. I've been hesitant the last year, but um, they're gonna start paying a price here soon. Um, I, I, just think, I think if anything, I coach third, right? So, uh, and just the amount of uh, situational prepare, the, the amount of situations I'm trying to prepare them for on every pitch that you can even see them like rolling their eyes. Like, I understand I tag on a ball in the air. I freeze on a line drive. I'm going on the ground. I'm doing this. I'm coming back and fall ground. Like, I, I, but I do it every single pitch. Like, I'm on them. I'm on them. Because right? I'm, I'm, big leaguers forget. That, that's right, right? <laughs> and then as soon as I don't do it, it's, it, I'll tell you what, when you coach these kids, you think something like, God, the right fielder looks a little shallow. He should be a little deeper. I swear to you, the next ball's just over his head. It's amazing. Coaching in general, and I know it's only like youth baseball, um, it is, I, now I see like the anxiety that like say my dad had or my parents, or like somebody watching that has a son or daughter playing a sport, you can never know because you just simply do not have the bat in your hand. You have no control. As much as you try to like control it, you have zero. And like I'm sitting there looking at the field, looking at everything that can go wrong. And like, again, if you're not thinking of, I feel like if I'm thinking about it all, it, it can be okay. But as soon as I miss something, it inevitably comes back to bite you. And I'm sure like these guys here, even at this level, um, it, it, you just feel like you are so helpless sometimes. It's all on the players to go out there and kind of do it. But at 13, which I'm coaching, um, again, the listening might not be at its best and the buy-in factor, <laughs> the buy-in factor might not be quite what I wanted at times, but, um, it's, it's one of those, like, you know, once you've had, when you haven't seen somebody in a long, if you see, if you see some, everybody every day, if you see the same person every day, you don't see like their hair, like talk about BJ, his beard. If you're around him every day, you're like, I never really noticed your beard got so long, but if you haven't seen him in two years, you're like, oh my God, look at the beard on this guy. <laughs> I have to trust the fact that I'm seeing these kids every day and I feel like we're not getting any better. We stink. Like this is not, these kids haven't learned a damn thing since I've been coaching them. But the people that jump in and out of the frame are like, wow, this kid is really developed in this area and all that. But I don't see it as much because I'm right there with them all the time. Well, that's, that's, that's the best way to probably put it. You're like, no, he's not. Yeah, I'm like, he stinks. <laughs> he should take two weeks off and quit. <laughs> You got traded twice very early in your big league career and you ended up in the right place. But can you remember what you felt like? You had to be really pissed at one point and then you had to be like, again? Yeah, I think the first time I was, I was never upset because I, I think I was always instilled in me, whether it was my dad, whatever, this is a business. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, and also that if you're getting traded, someone on the other side wants you. Um, but the first time I got traded, I was coming from like kind of a older veteran type situation where I was scuffling and I was going to a younger, Team. So I kind of was welcoming to it, or I, I wouldn't say I was welcoming, but I wasn't mad. I was thinking, okay, like this could be a good thing. Um, the second time when I came traded to the White Sox, I think that was the first time I really thought about like, again, being basically kind of like a one dimensional player, um, hitter, not playing the infield, middle infield, not being a runner, not being a fourth outfielder type or outfielder. That was probably the first time, like when I got traded to the White Sox of like, this is probably it here. Like, um, like I was 22 years old and that was probably the first time it occurred to me that like, what if I was like out of the game? You know, like this could be the end of the road here if I don't do anything. Um, so that was probably my thoughts going into this. But when I got to the first spring training here, which was in Tucson then, um, 
it was a great group. It was a young, it was, there was a lot of people that were in the same boat as me. And it, that makes you feel comfortable right away. Jerry Manuel was the manager who at that moment, I think was a great manager for me and that team. Cause he was a patient guy and very like had a good bedside manner. Um, and it didn't happen right away, but like I could tell from the beginning, I was a little bit better there and I was kind of trending better. And I think in May, and obviously as a young player, the one thing you're afraid of most, like guys here today, if, you're, if you haven't been in the, you're afraid of getting sent back, right? You just want to be there. You just want to be in the big leagues. Like that's the big thing. And I, I, even getting into like May of that year, June, I still wasn't sure. Like, I think I was hitting like maybe 250 with like six homers and like, 25 RBIs, like not bad, but like not like breaking down the door either. And I still was nervous. I was still like, I don't know, like this every day feels like this needs to be great. I remember Jerry just coming up one day being like, man, you all right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, like whatever. And he's like, listen, dude, you're going to be here. Like you're not going anywhere. You're going to be here the rest of the year. And I was like, you know, and then wow. everything started coming. Like, don't just, you're going to be, you're going to be here. Cause I, as a young player, you feel like every move you make is like the difference between you might get sent out or you stand, it's just a, it puts it on such a pedestal that it's hard to, your, your talent to come out. And uh, at least then, I think now, to be honest, if there is talk about like nowadays and, you know, now and then, it is easier to break into the big leagues nowadays because there's younger people, your peers are more around you everywhere. You can go from college into the, I will say that, I will stand and die on that hill, that when I, when I came up to the big leagues, I think there was like three guys on the team that were 40. Wow. There right? was guys smoking in the clubhouse. <laughs> like you walk in, they're like, 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 and then they look at you and be like, like, like it was uncomfortable. <laughs> like, right. Like it was an uncomfortable situation. So I will always say that. And I'm sure before me and before me, before me, like it was harder to come up years ago than it is now. Um, because there's just been this youth movement. If you look at rosters and the, and the facts prove it, you know, the, the, the rosters, the ages have gone down and, um, it, 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 you can walk in and feel more like yourself. And if you feel like yourself, the talent of whatever it is you do is it tends to be more what will come out. You know, that wasn't the case when I was a young player, you know. Is that where the foot speed came from on that inside the park homer? <laughs> People to this day, I get that came up the other day on the golf course. Like someone was, uh, you know, breaking my chops about something. And I'm like, listen, you can say what you want, but I'm like, I do have an inside the park. And they're like, what? Like they thought I was joking. They were like, they thought it was the biggest joke. I'm like, no, they're like in the big leagues, you have a, uh, inside the Parker. I'm like, look it up. I'm like, and so of course we sat there on the course, looked it up and you know, I had, a, we didn't see video of it. I had to explain how it happened, but, um, yeah, that was definitely, I mean, as slow as I was, you have to admit like that, that's why this game's great. Like stuff like that happens. You know what I mean? Like how does a guy like me get an inside the Parker? how did you feel when you got into the dugout? After <sighs> I mean, you know, I think hit me the most is like, I was like, that counts as a real home run, right? Like, that's like, that's just the same. That, at the end of the year, like, that's the same as a real home run. Like, it's not, and I was just thinking like, that's pretty cool, you know? <laughs> well, uh, by the way, this is part one of probably a seven part, uh, if we continue this podcast yeah. over the years, you're, you are coming back. We got a million things to get to. But before we let you go this week, um, we have to mention 05. And I don't want to, I don't want to get on Scott Pitsednik's bad side, but... As, as good as that club was at all the little stuff, as great as the rotation was that year, you guys mashed. A lot of homers. Right. And yeah. Scott, I think, had a triple and a home run, and, you know, obviously in the World Series. But not that you're offended by it, but, like, nobody mentions how, how you guys, like, you did the big things really well, too. Yeah. It matters, right? I think it does. I mean, I think you have to have the capability of uh, popping a three-run homer you know, throughout the season that kind of wins you a game. I mean, I think Earl Weaver said something about that once. <laughs> um, but here's what I'd say about that team and specifically what you're talking about. I think what it is, is it's, it's, it's not even about the statistics of like this team hits a bunch of homers or they're, but I, with that team though, showed up to play a low scoring, tough, two to one game and it got very comfortable. And so even though we hit a lot of homers, we didn't, cause what happens is if you're a team that just relies on the homer, like mentally, and like, that's what you, cause it's fun. If you're a team that kind of like gets into that, as soon as a game, like you get into like the sixth or seventh inning and it's one of those games, that's not that you're like, Oh geez, like this is a, this is one of the tough ones. 
and you lose that game. You know, and I feel like that team, what that team was good on, like we've hit a bunch of homers, but we never got caught up in saying like, well, that's what we do. We play, I mean, you can look at that season. I believe it was like opening day, first game after the break, and the World Series clinchers were all one nothing games. Um, we felt comfortable in those games. We felt like that was our style of game, and we preferred that style of game and never were nervous. We felt like we would win more than those than we lost. And so I think that's the trick is that if you can hit your homers, and you can, but you can't get – you can't want the easy wins like oh let's go blow these guys out 10 to 2 and then you find yourself in a 5 to 4 game in the 7th and you're like well this isn't how we drew it up you have to draw it up as the 5 to 4 game and if it turns into the blowout beautiful but that's that's the but that's hard every day by the way cuz you get tired you know and you want the easy games you want the easy wins but you can't do it what was 06 like being the defending champs that that's that's different right it's, yeah well, well i would five. i think it was you know again you looking back on it at the time, I probably wouldn't have said this, and I probably didn't know it, but like you look back on it, and I'd say, well, I think that team fell in maybe a little bit. The first half of that year, we were hitting, everything was clicking again. I think from like the break, I think we were like the best team again at the break that year. Um, but I would say that that team didn't want, we got into a little bit of a dogfight there in September and just kind of like, that's just too hard kind of thing. That's what it felt like. I mean, maybe that's, I can remember personally, like, do we really want to like, cause you know, the September before was very hard to get in. We blew that lead and everything. So I, I just, teams have that, I guess it was stamina. Did we have the stamina to want to get into that type of fight again? And we certainly had some of the goods. I think some of the, some guys got hurt or whatever, but we were a really good team for a lot of that year. But when it came to that time, like at the end, we just were short. And we fell short, and I think it was a lot because we just kind of ran out of gas, which could be understandable. Maybe that's why teams don't repeat. Right. Um, but that was—it's hard to win, really but hard. like it's hard to repeat because you, you give so much the year before that it's tough to have that much in the tank again. So credit to the teams that do. But that's kind of the general thing. It's kind of like what I said: like you don't have the the will to want to do all those things to like win those ball games that are, you know, cold in September and like going out there. You you tend not to be as and then we didn't, and that's what you get out of it. I want to ask you one thing before we let you go, a short question. But we're in this, in this conference room in Glendale, if you're not watching the video, and we have all these pictures around us of 05. And I want to ask you if you could have one picture of 05. It doesn't even need to be a picture that was taken. But if you have one memory that you could have blown up on your wall, what would that be from that season? Hmm. Man. Um... Funny, serious, whatever. Jesus, you know that team. You, I spoke with Jerry this past week. I hadn't spoken with Jerry in a while, and uh, you know I was telling him, "It's like you think about the World Series every day. I think about it every day. I mean, like it comes into my mind some point every day. So um, it's a big deal, and um, it definitely is like a life changing event. The fact that you win one of those things, um, I, you know, I, I would say. Let me see some of these pictures. Maybe it would spark my yeah i mean i we got one of you pumping your fists yeah that's a good one right there that's, a, that's an awkward looking photo isn't it, <laughs> it one photo i i would say that it would be obviously nothing nothing um competes with the actual and the end result of like winning the world series but i'll tell you like the pride i felt in the team we were so close to like blowing a 15 game lead like what was it 15 and a half or whatever it was and uh i wish like you know after we, we clinched in detroit to get into the playoffs and at that point even before we won the world series like this felt like a really special team because of that and you could just felt like the weight was off our shoulders and so it's almost like if i could have one picture it would probably be like maybe the, the start a picture of us before we started the Boston series because that team went through such a roller coaster and like was so not who they were and a lot of moments there because we were questioning everything but like when we showed up to play at the beginning of that postseason it was like no no like we're back and like we're and you could just tell we went out and hammered them the first game and it was like yeah and so yeah the stuff at the end and all that like all these pictures here like this was great um but yeah, just the amount of, I think it was like the amount of pride just to have conquered that thing to get in was such a big deal. I think about that a lot because, man, we, we just felt like we had already died 
like that s September because it was such a pressure packed thing. And obviously now as an older person, you look back and it's like, it's not life and death. It isn't, but man, it felt like it at the time. Like we felt like we were going to be, you know, so definitely like, you know, that, that was a big moment, I think. And it gets lost in the shuffle sometimes because of the end result. But, um, man, it was, uh, it was a great, it was a great, uh, it was a great run and a bunch of great guys. And, and, uh, obviously it was, it fits in with the city that, that I'll say this, that's the one thing. If we would have known how much it would have meant to people, I know people that were with the Cubs and everything felt the same thing. Like if you would have known the impact you had on people while you were playing, you probably would have gripped it way too tight and failed because man, you, I had no idea the, uh, the, the reach of how that hit people. You know what I mean? To this day, you get people coming up to you like in tears and some, you know, that are like, hey, I want to thank you because they tell their story, you know? And it's like, uh, man, I, I'm glad I didn't know this was on the line here when I was <laughs> playing because I would have been ripping it too tight. But that's the thing. And that's what maybe, you know, I try to talk to some of these guys today about that is that, you know, it's like this matters to people big time. So, you know, go out there and, and, and get it done because you can, because you can get it done, you know? Last one real quick. Are you Paulie and Paul at the same time, or are they two different people? So when you hear Paulie, are you baseball, Canerco, and when you're Paul, you're a civilian? This 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 has a very uh, <laughs> this has a very uh, Ken Harrelson Hawk, and Hawk go. Harrelson it kind of yeah. No, I'm just Paul all the time. I hope. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't have an alter ego, um, you know. But, uh, but no when you one really. Paulie, you know, there's there's a baseball side to it. Yes. 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 When someone calls me Polly or like I see people that don't know me call me that because no one that really knows me calls me that, you know, no one like, Hey, Polly, what's going on? Maybe, I don't know. But yeah, definitely uh, the, the Polly chance and like the, that's how I think most fans that I don't know would relate to me as uh, in terms of how I, they, they probably think that's how everybody right. calls me that. But yeah, no, it's not, it's, it's just Paul. You talk about people who really know you. Bob Bechtel was mouthing me the answer to that question as you were giving it. Yeah. Which is amazing. Bob's an old pro. Bob's been here, you know, longer than just about anybody now. And uh, how, how have you been here this long? You know, you must have got something on. Fly under the radar. <laughs> Flying under the radar. Yeah, there's a few of you guys out here that like to fly under the radar. Uh, he's one of the, Bob's the second best PR guy in the game. Problem is all the rest are tied for first. <laughs> You hate to see it. Paul Canerco, <laughs> always a pleasure talking to you. Absolutely. Thanks Thank for you having for me. This. I appreciate it. Thank appreciate you. you. Thank Paul. you.